Welcome mothers and others. I'm so glad you all are here today. We had to move um, we had to move our webinar up a few hours because uh, Mothers Against Greg Abbott's going to be receiving an award this evening with the uh, Travis County Democrats as Organization of the Year. So I'm super excited because we'll be doing that tonight. And um, so we kind of had changed around our schedule a little bit, but I'm super duper excited to introduce to you Jay Kleber, who is running for Texas um, Land Commissioner. He is a sixth generation Texan and he is running because we need to protect our land. And we've had a lot of inaction going on in the Texas General Land Office. So Jay can really help us, you know, just get some get a better uh, vision for what we could do with Texas land as far as um, just land management, energy, education, veterans, and the list goes on and on. Because what you may not know is you may not know all of the things that the land office actually does. So we're gonna educate you all about all of those things here today. So welcome, Jay. I'm so glad you're here with us. Can you start out by introducing yourself and telling us a little bit about what the role of the Texas General Land Commissioner does and how it affects Texans? Happy to do that. And first, thank you so much for having me here and congratulations. You, you really deserve that <laughs> award. Um, I see your signs everywhere. I know that's not that's not everything, uh, but I see them all over the state of Texas. And I've seen your billboards up as well. And you're really just doing amazing work. And so I want to thank you for, for everything that you've done. My name is Jay Clayberg, and I'm the Democratic nominee for Texas Land Commissioner. And the Land Commissioner is the oldest state agency. Uh, it's an independent constitutional office. Uh, it's the oldest in the state. And it manages 13 million acres of public land and generates about a billion dollars a year right now, primarily from energy leases for the largest K-12 and down in the country. And the land commissioner sits on the board of the permanent school fund and also uh, oversees the Veterans Land Board, which provides low interest loans to veterans to acquire land and homes and do home improvements and then oversees 10 veterans homes in the state of Texas. The newest one is in Fort Worth and four veteran cemeteries. And just to put that in perspective, we have a million and a half veterans in the state of Texas and about 7,500 veterans are taking advantage of that program, uh, which has not had an executive director for over two years now. <clears throat> it also oversees the Alamo and uh, coastal protection work and disaster recovery efforts. So uh, in the wake of Hurricane Dolly, Hurricane Harvey, the funds that come in from uh, Congress into the state, FEMA and, and Housing and Urban Development, come through the General Land Office. And uh, right now we've got about $8 billion backlogged uh, over the last 10 years that has not been invested in communities like the city of Houston, Harris County, Jefferson County, places in Nueces and all the way down into Cameron County. So it's a really important job and it's why we've been traveling around the state. I got about 60,000 miles on now my second truck because uh, the first one we burned out. And um, what we're finding is that people really have no idea that the office is so important. And that's a big part of our job is to, is to make sure we're educating people. So thank you for giving me this platform uh, to talk about it. Yes, thank you so much. So you mentioned veterans and um, over the summer, people may or may not have known all of the work that you've been doing for veterans for here, tech, veterans here in Texas. You recently went to D.C. to support uh, veterans health care, in particular, uh, working with um with the Honoring Our Pact Act. You work collaboratively with the Burn, Burn Pits 360 group. Can you tell me a little bit about why you got involved with the group and um, how, how it just all went down there in, in DC when you were there, because what really happened was that I was so happy to hear. I was so angry that all of these, um, all of these people, all these congressmen voted against it. And then we shamed the hell out of them. And then they changed their mind and they finally passed it. And thank God that they finally did, but we really had to do something about that. And, and you were there alongside John um, John Stewart and and that whole entire crew that was really trying to make positive changes and support our veterans. So um, tell us a little bit about 
how that all came to be and what was the solution that came came about in the end. Sure. So in the course of this campaign, we've been traveling around the state. I've visited all of the state veteran cemeteries and most of the, the veterans homes. And so we were in the Corpus region and Leroy and Rosie Torres, who started Burn Pits 360. Leroy has more than 20 years of service in the military. Rosie actually worked for the um, Veterans Affairs and they've been fighting for um, benefits for veterans exposed to toxic burn pits for over a decade. So the credit goes to them for fighting for so long for all the other veterans that were there with us. But we met along the campaign trail and I went and visited them at their office and they're really investing in the health care of veterans lives and really <clears throat> impressed upon me that after a uh, tour of duty uh, and once a, a veteran comes back specifically to Texas, that there's a transition period and that it's our responsibility to make sure that they are um, given the best opportunity to succeed. And that looking at the Veterans Land Board and the work that it could be doing, um, realized that I wanted to be helpful in some way. And, and what we realized was that the legislature about two sessions ago had established the Toxic Burn Pit Registry uh, to allow veterans in the state of Texas to establish the fact that they were exposed to toxins during their service. And then when the National Registry finally would get funded, and the benefits would come through, uh, that they would be on the list so they wouldn't have to fight for it. And what we realized was, and my opponent had been part of that group, they had signed the legislation to establish it, but then they turned around and didn't fund it. So it exists, but no veteran in the state of Texas knows that it does. And so we realized there that there was actually something that we could do as the land commissioner to help these veterans. And so we proposed to bring that registry inside of the Veterans Land Board because they have such a broad purview and make sure that we're funding it and we're making veterans aware. And so they invited me to go to D.C. after we talked through some of the policy platform and said, you know what, we're going to go up there in August and we're actually going to be celebrating the passage because it had passed in June and there were some minor administrative um, uh, clerical errors that needed to be fixed. And so we were going up there actually with John Stewart and all these veterans to celebrate. And what happened was the Senate uh, Republicans had had a, a bill passed by the Democrats a few days prior, and they really had no leverage against them to punch them for passing this bill. And trust me, I walked in these halls for half a day trying to figure out why on earth our representatives, Cornyn and Cruz, would vote against a package that was $300 billion that had been fought for for over a decade, that they had voted on 30 days prior, and that would impact positively the lives of three and a half million veterans. And it was out of spite. There is no, no other way of saying it. And so we walked the halls and we went into Cruz and Cornyn's office and other senators to urge them to pass this. There was no re had a veteran who had had a friend of his call him when he heard that it hadn't passed. And about 30 minutes after that conversation, his wife called and he'd taken his life. And I know that those senators have heard those stories. And to be so callous um, flies in the face of everything that I think Texans and Americans believe. And so we stayed the night on the steps of the Senate, Leroy and Rosie and the Burn Pits 360 group and others um, stayed there and fought for that over the next week or so. And then back in mid-August, I was invited to go back up to sign in of the PACT Act. And so that, that's the kind, kind of work that <clears throat> we have been doing. And my opponent, as just to give you a contrast, had the opportunity to sign a letter uh, lead a letter that the VFW had asked her to sign in, in a spring, summer, urging Cruz and Cornyn to pass a legislation. And she she offered, uh, uh, opted not to, not just to not lead it, but not to sign the letter. And then on top of that, back a few years ago, uh, her father-in-law is the chair of an organization called National American University. And National American University is like Trump University, it's a private um, for-profit college online that preyed upon 
primarily veterans for their GI Bill dollars. And when I say preyed upon, I mean that the graduation rate was about 22 to 25 percentage points. And to put that in perspective, University of Texas is 79 percent. And the debt load of those veterans was in the in the ballpark of about thirty five thousand dollars after they went through the program at UT. It's about twenty two thousand. And so her husband, who is her treasurer, is still um, on the board of National American University now, several years later. And the funding that she got uh, um, more than. 75, 80 percent of the funding that she got when she ran for Senate the first time came from those who were either directly associated with that organization or from fees that she got for either serving on the board or just being associated with it. And so to me, I've tried not to be at all negative during this campaign, but but that is an affront to everything that I believe we care about as Texans and the kind of service uh, that we should be providing to to veterans. Yeah, a- amen. I had no idea that 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 was her position. That was some where she was getting some of her money. That that's very surprising to me. It seems to be incredibly unethical, you know, in so many ways, for her to do that. Um, so th- uh, we're let's talk about Don Buckingham because we, we really do need to talk about her. Um, she, she states in her campaign that you will use public school funding as a piggy bank for your leftist green energy dreams, which is so ridiculous. I just want to laugh. It's so ridiculous. You know, here we are in Texas and we have, we have kids in schools and we all know that our public schools are, are really suffering from, um, from just the, the stronghold of lack of funding. So when she says this, it just, it makes me want to slap her silly. But anyway, so can you tell us about what your plans are for the permanent um, school fund and for how to ensure that our schools have more access to funds in the future and how you plan on diversifying that? Yeah, let, let me just lay down some facts. So we have the largest K through 12 educational endowment in the country. It's $58 billion. And we rank 44th in the country in the amount of money that we spend per student in the state of Texas. We have a quality of education that's 45th in the U.S. So even if you want to just look at the data, we're not performing very well. And in talking with prior land commissioners about why from 1986 to 2018, the endowment tripled in size, but the inflation adjusted distributions remain flat. The answer was we want the corpus to grow so that public schools can bond against it and then get a triple A rating because of the size of the endowment and they pay less interest. But if you talk to anyone who's on a school board, you will understand that the legislature has forced language on bond referendums that even if that bond does not increase your taxes, the language on the ballot has to say this will increase your taxes. So at a time when we're saying that we want to increase the size of the endowment, we're not pushing down as much money as we could to uh, public schools. If you look at a Houston Chronicle and the Texas Tribune has reported on this over the last three or four years, that the returns have been um, not as, as good as other endowments across the country. And the amount of money that's actually going into the available school fund, and I won't get into details, but there are two ways that the permanent school fund can push money down in the public school system. One that's more direct, that's the available school fund. And another, the um, foundation school fund, which the legislature has a little bit more leeway over. But you look at the amount of money that's going into our uh, public school system through that endowment. And the last few years, it's been about one point seven to two billion dollars, which out of a five point eight billion dollar endowment is not commiserate with the kind of um, interest and distribution that we should be making. And so that's on the distribution side of things. Right now, we're generating one point one billion dollars a year in revenue from permanent school fund lands. And as I mentioned before, we got 13 million acres of them. 7 million of those permanent school fund lands are mineral estate only, so no surface rights. And the royalty that we get off of that 
primarily from oil and gas leases, is 25%. That is the backbone of not just the permanent school fund, but of the Texas economy. I make no bones about that. We've got more than a million jobs that are associated with the oil and gas industry. We have the port of Houston alone is nearly a trillion dollar a year uh, enterprise. And uh, we've got to make sure that not only do, should we support that, but that we're also making good investments in diversifying our portfolio, just like anyone would with their stock portfolio. And so my proposal is to look at technology like large scale carbon storage is a very good example. We've got 4 million acres of submerged lands off the Texas coast that is permanent school fund land. And the USGS and the University of Texas Bureau of Economic Geology studied that um, formation. And about 10,000 feet down, we've got the equivalent of um, 700 years worth of Texas industrial carbon emissions. And if you've been following uh, the 45Q credit or Inflation Reduction Act, the 45Q tax credit, you get $80 per metric ton of CO2 stored, Okay. And I asked UT to do a calculation of what would that mean in fees, just like um, storing uh, saltwater disposal, for instance, uh, from oil and gas wells. What would the fee look like in storing <clears throat> emissions in our submerged lands, doing it safely, doing it permanently? It's $5.5 billion in additional revenue. And just so you know that I'm not crazy, the General Land Office already has a lease on 40,000 acres off the coast of Jefferson County with a group called Talus Energy to do this, essentially take emissions out of the air and put them into the ground. And so that's what I'm talking about in terms of diversification. And I think we've got a lot of opportunities there. And I'll just say, if you have someone who's actually interested in showing up for work and who's not making decisions about the next election cycle, while they're actually in office, because that's my opinion of what's been happening, at least for the last eight years. And I think that's what will happen with uh, if we elect someone like Don, who has no relevant background in this office and in talking with her colleagues, really has no interest in this office. It just happened to be the only open seat of all the statewides. And uh, she's going to sit there. Uh, she wants to sit there while everyone's waiting around for the next election. And that's a complete, as I have just explained to you, this is a $2.9 billion a year annual budget business. That's the only revenue generating agency in the state of Texas. It takes care of our veterans. It takes care of our school children. And it helps Texans prepare for and recover from natural disasters. And what you've seen is that when you're not at home, when you're not working, then veterans die, literally double the death rate in our veterans' homes during the, the pandemic, double the death rate of any other long-term care facility in the state of Texas. You have millions of people that are left underwater and in the dark in uh, Harris County in the city of Houston while they have been hit by natural disaster after natural disaster. So it's important who holds this office. Yeah. Thank you for that. So that brings us uh, into Houston and um, Hurricane Harvey and how hard Houston and that whole entire the Texas coastline was hit by Hurricane Harvey. And we are still recovering from this. It's like been five years and we're still recovering from this. So I don't know about anyone else, but, uh, you know, I had a little bit of, of like I was triggered last week when all the things happened in Florida because it just reminded me we're still we're still not recovered from Harvey. And it definitely triggered something deep in me when, when I was putting all of that together. So um, asking you, you recently, you talked, um, you had a, a, an announcement recently about uh, how to use disaster relief funds. And so can you tell us a little bit about your position um, for das uh, disaster relief funds, how to use it, and what we can do to help out um, those those families that have been hard hit in Harvey that are still waiting for solutions that have still have no answers. Yeah, we were down in Cameron County with a commissioner and a representative there talking about disaster recovery, which might seem unusual for Texans because we've been so focused on Harris County and Jefferson County and Iran's that got hit with Harvey, but. 
you've had uh, disastrous floods in the valley uh, in the last three or four years. You did have uh, damages from Hurricane Dolly, which was more than 10 years ago. And there's still uh, several hundred million dollars that have not been allocated down in Cairn County to help Texans recover from and then prepare for the next disaster. Essentially, what we're doing is we're just waiting for the next disaster to happen or not prepared for. And so we rolled out a full uh, policy on how we plan for these natural disasters. If you look at even the general land office, they rate uh, counties for um, how at risk they are for the next hurricane or the next flood. And so we know where it's going to happen. We can model uh, what it would look like if a category four, for instance, hit Galveston again or hit Harris County, what it would do in terms of of storm surge and to those communities. Uh, essentially, what we're dealing with in the future is either too much or too little water in the state of Texas. That is the challenge that that we face. And we rank number one in billion dollar natural disasters. So we have something to say about how we prepare. So pre-recovery is a part of my platform, making sure that we're actually planning before the disaster hits. So how, how are we going to use that money? How are we going to use FEMA? How will we use HUD dollars? And then forming a bottom advisory council is consistent of community members and community leaders and organizations that essentially right now are serving HEB and churches uh, in the state of Texas uh, and, and community organizations uh, and disaster recovery nonprofits are our disaster recovery right now. Uh, we, we don't really have a functioning, well-oiled uh, machine in our disaster recovery, especially on the long-term side of things. And so we want to make sure that really within the first 90 days, we've got a plan to get what is uh, about $8 billion in backlog funding at down into communities. And I'll just give you one last example of how that should work. So after Hurricane Harvey, General Land Office puts forth about 20 coastal counties that, that say uh, initially that's where the fund the funds for uh, mitigation, about $4 billion should should go. Those are the counties that should compete. But they came back to us in development and said, you know what, we're going to add another 29 counties to the list of eligible counties for these funds. You look at the disaster risk rating for those additional 29 and even the damages that were incurred from Hurricane Harvey, and they're not even in the ballpark of those 18 coastal counties. And so essentially what they did was they brought in these more rural counties, and you know how those rural counties vote, and they put forth competition for dollars that essentially when you look at, at Harris County alone, $125 billion storm was Hurricane Harvey, 50% of those damages were in Harris County. And so it should be that those funds should go to where the, the uh, where Congress meant to appropriate them. So from the, the pre-planning to how we're actually allocating those dollars and who's eligible, and then really just making sure that there are a number of ways, and I won't go into it, but there are a number of ways that you can get disaster recovery dollars into the ground in communities. And you look at Hurricane Sandy or you look at uh, storms in Louisiana or Florida, you can do direct allocations. You can work with Council of Governments. You can uh, uh, go through the general land office as if it were a general contractor, which is essentially what we're doing now. Uh, but there are huge disparities right now in how the general land office is doing its job. And so I wanna make sure that we're doing it efficiently, we're doing it effect effectively and equitably, because right now it's taking five to six years for us to recover. And in the meantime, we're just getting hit by uh, the next disaster. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's definitely what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing ourselves not being prepared for that next disaster. And we have um, climate change coming on very quickly. Um, so let's go right ahead and let's uh, let's talk a little bit about climate change. Um, OK, how do we prepare ourselves for climate change? And I would also like to touch on water. I mean, water is such a huge issue right now for Texas. And the one issue like this whole entire summer, while Greg Abbott has been talking about border issue, border issue, border issue, 
What you have not been hearing about is the fact that two counties in Texas are almost out of water. We had Hidalgo and Cameron, they're running very, very low in water. We have a lot of water tables that have currently have had um, some, some fracking issues uh, be, we know that have leaked some pollutants into the water tables there. We have a lot of water issues in Texas, and this is going to be a much, much bigger issue moving forward in the Texas future. So I wanted to get your feedback on that and climate change and how this is all tied together. Yeah, on the on the climate change side of things, you know, one very specific example is we pour about $100 million a year into fortifying the coastline. That's dune replenishment. It's making sure that our, our coastline is not eroding um, at, at a, a rapid rate. And if you look at the science that is uh, in those plans, or if you look at something like uh, what was called the Texas Coastal Plan and has re been renamed the Coastal Spine, that's a $30 billion investment in the Texas coast over the next 20 years. If you look at the science, it is not based on what we're seeing in the last 10 years or what we are going to see over the next 20 years. It gets up to, for example, just shy of what we are already seeing, a Category 2 storm, for instance, and just at 15-foot storm surge. That is what the plans for the coastal spine and the dike system that will be created or developed there in the Galveston Bay area. That's what it calls for. Hurricane Harvey was a category four. And we know that we're going to see more than um, one hurricane at a time. And we're also going to see more than 15 foot storm surge. The science is there and the modeling out of our own Texas universities shows that. So essentially what we're doing, even if you want to make a conservative, a fiscally conservative argument out of this, is that we are investing money in infrastructure that will be obsolete on arrival. And so that's the kind of argument that I've been making with folks across the, the state is whether it's uh, investing in resiliency along the coast or how we manage that 13 million acres of public land in a way that uh, recharges our aquifers. And in a place like the Rio Grande watershed, where you've got a tremendous amount of water that's actually coming out of Mexico, and you get down to the Rio Grande Valley, and 100% of the agriculture and residential communities there rely on the river. So there is no aquifer that they're tapping. And so how can the general land office in being a steward of land upriver, primarily in the, the Big Bend region, how can we manage those lands in a way that's good for the watershed? How we manage our oil and gas resources, our energy resources, and making sure that to the degree that we possibly can, we're recycling and reusing produced water so that we're not bringing fresh water in to uh, produce energy, essentially, in the state of Texas. University lands, uh, which is the permanent university fund uh, uh, revenue generator, they are doing things like that. They're in, uh, incentivizing uh, producers to make sure that they're operating responsibly and uh, capping venting and flaring and utilizing uh, that for uh, for energy resources and making sure that the funds from that are, are going to the permanent school fund. So there's a lot on that that we could be doing and even on the outer edges of desal. So the general land office in the natural resources code has the ability to be a partner in desalination. And I know that it's expensive. I know that there are environmental concerns with desal, especially in the, in the port, port of Corpus and Corpus Christi area in terms of where does that discharge go? I know all of that. But we have to have an all of the above approach to these things. And we have to be clear eyed about the kind of, of weather that we have seen or are going to see. And it's imperative to me that we're making science-based decisions. And to me, that is how Texas agriculture has operated for 200 years. We, we make informed decisions about the weather and weather patterns and when to plant and, and how much water we have available to us. And so why this should be any different, it has just been politicized. Um, and so I wanna depoliticize it and say, look, this is all just practical and we should be investing in uh, resiliency in the state of Texas because it impacts not just rural parts of the state 
Um, but it impacts certainly urban areas where more than 80 percent of people are living right now. Absolutely. So you have an office that's actually a constitutional office. So it's not necessarily like a Democratic office, Republican office. It's a constitutional office. So can you explain what that actually means? Yeah, I like to mention that in my comments about the office, because one, there's some reverence I have for it. It's the oldest constitutional office in the state of Texas. It was actually formed before they even established the governorship. And so to be using it as a political stepping stone, I think, is is really a disservice to not just the office, but to Texans. And, and second, it's independent of the legislature. And I like to say this because, you know, people think, well, you know, if you're operating in an environment that is um, toxic and you happen to be a Democrat holding a statewide office, uh, hopefully one of many, uh, but you're still in a situation where you're going to have to work across the aisle. It is an office that has its its own budget associated with permanent school funds. And so those, those dollars stay within the uh, public school system. They stay within that, um, that entity. The Veterans Land Board, that is a, a self-funded mechanism. So the legislature does not insert, nor does it take money from that entity. The disaster recovery, the $8.4 billion uh, that it's responsible for, that also is tied to housing and urban development. And uh, the uh, it's a grant system, basically. So the only interaction that it really has with the legislature is about $300 million right now. And, and that's dwindling because of the money that it spent through the Alamo and the Alamo um, planning process. And so I'll, I'll give you one last sort of example. I talked to Gary Morrow, who's the uh, last Democrat to hold this office, and he's been very supportive. And I asked him before launching this campaign, what's an environment look like if you've got you know bipartisanship and you're going to have to work you know across the aisle? And he said, well, I was land commissioner under both uh, Ann Richards and Bush. And if I ever had a question about uh, what we were doing and whether it was actually part of the responsibilities of the office, I'd take it to the Texas Supreme Court because I'm a constitutional officer and every single time they ruled in my favor. And so that that's what I like to, to talk about is that, that the things that we've talked about for the last 40 minutes are all very much possible and, and need to happen um, because we deserve that in, in a land commissioner. Yeah, we absolutely do. So um, you've been going on this tour all over Texas and going uh, to all these dance halls and meeting all kinds of people, including Republicans. So I wanted you to see, could you share a couple of stories about maybe some Republicans that you are meeting that are considering voting for you and um, maybe voting for other Democrats? I mean, what, what are you feeling on the ground talking to real Texans, not just the ones that are answering polls? Yeah. So we've been on a, a tour of Texas. We've got about 60,000 miles now on the road. And one of the things that we launched a few months ago was a, a, a dance hall tour. And the the impetus, uh, the goal of that was to get into places like Devil's Backbone in Wimberley or the Golden Light up in Amarillo or the Stagecoach in Tarrant County or um, Rio Starlight, where we were last night up in Longview and invite people in regardless of party affiliation or religious affiliation or their zip code to actually learn a little bit about the land office here. Listen, listen to some music. And actually have conversations with people um, in their community that maybe they don't uh, don't ha haven't had conversations with in a long time. And I'll just give you an example of Amarillo. We were there in the golden light and there were 150 or so people in um, in that establishment. Ninety eight percent of them were conservative and it allowed me being there to, to go around before we started the music uh, to talk to them and talk to them about what they're doing. There were uh, folks that were working in the oil and gas industry in New Mexico. There were others in ag business. There were others in the banking business. And I'll give you an example. There was a group of, of uh, men and women who were 
I know Republicans sitting down at a table uh, that work for a bank there and they were cordial and I introduced myself and we talked for a little bit, but I could tell they're a little standoffish. Well, the president of the bank comes in, who is a Republican, who I know, and he greets me and they all kind of, you know, turn their heads and are surprised that I know this guy. And it really did sort of drop their guard. And we ended up, you know, having a beer or two and talking about the responsibilities of this off, which one, again, they, they don't know that it exists, but they're also not socially charged things, which those are all very important issues. Um, but I can talk about land. We can talk about water. We can talk about veterans and things that, you know, public schools, which in these rural parts of Texas, they are seeing defunded. They're absolutely seeing their public schools uh, dwindling and they don't have investment from the state. And so what I'm seeing on the ground and what you're seeing, I know, Nancy, from uh, folks that you're talking to is they're either quietly or some more publicly saying that for the first time ever, you know, they grew up conservative, but they don't even know what that means anymore. Um, and that after 20 years plus of um of administration by a party that does not have their best interests at heart, that that now they are seeing that they're alternatives. And uh, and so we've seen it all over the state that um, I, I really do think that this is a it's a pivotal moment in Texas history. And we're 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 out doing the work. That's the other thing I will tell you is you look at all of the candidates on the Democratic side. We are having to work for people's support. And on the other side, they really aren't. You could see it in that debate. And uh, they just are sort of phoning it in. And I think that that's going to come back to to hurt them. Yeah. As as I've been telling everyone, when 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 they're on Twitter and they're saying, but we're ahead in the polls where this, I just say, agree with them. Just let them think that they're ahead because then they won't see us coming because we're doing the work. We're, we're showing up. We're doing the work. We're trying to get out the vote. We all just have to not pay attention to polls, focus on doing the work. That is the most important thing right now. So let's talk a little bit about rural Texans. Um, one of the things that concerns me is that I, I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a ranch um, out in New Mexico, not necessarily Texas, but the feeling is the same. When you have, there's so much pride in go owning land and there's so much pride in owning a ranch. And what we're seeing now is that a lot of these folks, their children, it doesn't, uh, they don't go back and they work in the land because one, there might not be enough jobs. Two, climate change is starting to affect um, how much profit they're able to make on their land. We're starting to see what used to be thriving farmland turn into ghost towns, essentially, um, in some areas of Texas. So let's have a little bit of talk about what is happening right now in certain parts of rural Texas and what we can do to support our fellow rural Texans. Yeah, you're seeing in the data a couple hundred thousand acres of working lands lost in Texas. And, you know, you look at the, the economics and to to farm, maybe depending on where you are, net uh, profit, hundred dollars an acre. When in some in some areas, depending on your proximity to an urban area, you can get six hundred dollars an acre for solar installation. And so the, the economics of ensuring that we can continue to be what I think we have to be in the future. If you look at what's happened with Ukraine and the grain crisis there and how that pushed up prices is that we have to be food, fiber, water and energy independent. Texas needs to be. And we have 174 million acres to prove it. We're the number one energy producer in the world. We're number one in wind. We're number two in solar. And we have, you know, one in five, I believe, is the number jobs are associated with agriculture in the state of Texas. About 80 percent of water use in the state of Texas is agriculture. And so we have all these complex problems that we've got to address. And one very concrete example of what I think this office should be doing is we have what was uh, originated at the general land office called the farm and ranch lands conservation program. And it's an easement 
buyout program. So if you're a farmer or rancher and you want to continue to operate that land, and to your point, Nancy, you know, it's becoming more difficult and costly. Well, you can sell off the development rights, sell off a conservation easement. And that in general, general, it will provide about uh, 25% of the value of the property for selling those rights. And so you get you know, time value of money, you get an investment in that. And then ultimately it lowers your taxes because you've said, look, we're not going to uh, be developing the property in perpetuity. Right now, that program sits at Parks and Wildlife and it's about a $2 million a year program between Parks and Wildlife and our NRCS. It's not enough money. You have, a, I think, a lot of demand for uh, farmers or ranchers that say, look, we want to this is a legacy kind of investment for us. We've been doing this for 10, 20, 100 years, and we want to make sure we can continue to do that, or at least the land uh, does not get fragmented. And so I want to make sure that uh, we invest in that program through the general land office and, and increase the investment up to $10 million or more a year between those three organizations. It, it's a big issue and it when you land fragmentation absolutely is the biggest threat to our water resources to wildlife resources to open space in the state of Texas without a doubt and so we've got to work collaboratively with landowners and uh, organizations and state agencies to be a model for how we can actually do all of this and continue to sustain our population which is going to you know, it'll be 50 million by 2050 um and beyond yeah so um so you just you mentioned and you touched on this so i'm seeing all these things that are connecting together so uh you mentioned this earlier oil and gas let's talk about oil and gas we haven't really talked that much about it um we need to have a land commissioner that has a true vision for texas as far as oil and gas and our relationship to these oil and gas companies because they do lease texas lands and from those Texas lands is where we get money for our permanent school fund. And yep. now, like uh, one of the last times that we talked and we did a webinar, um, not, I don't know how many people here know this, but um, right now, I think you said it was just a couple of solar companies um, also are their funds go into the permanent school fund and maybe just a couple wind companies. So you had this vision about adding on more solar and wind so we can actually start increasing the permanent school funds so we can even be able to further invest into education in Texas. So could you talk to us a little bit about that? Yeah, so if th this data comes out of a, a policy group out of Dallas it's called Texas 2036, and they did a study um, that looked at public education funding. So not just K through 12, but in the entirety of our public school budget in the state of Texas. And they tied 20% uh, of that revenue to the oil and gas industry. So whether that's leases on uh, permanent school fund lands or permanent university fund lands, or that's the fuel tax, in some way, it's, it's about 20%. And they looked out to 2036 and they projected a potential, if this doesn't happen, great. But if it does, we could see a 30% decline in revenue from that 20% that funds our public education. And so what I looked at with the general land office is, okay, how much of the $1.1 billion is oil and gas, traditional oil and gas, and how much have we actually diversified that? And it doesn't have to necessarily be wind and solar. It could be geothermal, for instance. It could be um, uh, kinetic wave uh, energy. It could be what we talked about in terms of large scale carbon storage. It could be soil carbon sequestration. What are all the options, right? Right now, we have one wind and one solar lease on 13 million acres that's generating total annual about $360,000 a year out of a $1.1 billion that we're generating. And so my my push is that I'm not I, I am pro, uh, promoting an expansive approach to energy production because I think that's where Texas is going to lead in the future. Every form of energy. There is no other state. 
that has the infrastructure that we have, both the built infrastructure and also the employment infrastructure. People actually know how to generate energy. And we just happen to have 174 million acres of land. Plus, we've got a, a state owned lands that go out 10 miles into the Gulf of Mexico, which is no, no other state has that much acreage. And so there are all these opportunities. And Nancy, that's what we talked about last time is just being practical about this. And we've got to diversify. And it's not one or the other. It really is an all of the above approach. Yeah, absolutely. It, it is. We have to diversify and we have to have a better vision for what we could have mm -hmm. versus having no vision at all, which is where we're at right now. Um, one part of Texas, um, what Texas lands that we haven't talked about is Texas wildlife. So Texas wildlife is being impacted in all kinds of ways from climate change all um, all the way to a lot of disasters that are happening here. Um, and then you just actually you were a producer of Deep in the Heart of Texas, which is the first Texas nature documentary. So what could you tell us about what we need to be doing for Texas wildlife right now and into the future? Sure. Land, land fragmentation is definitely the number one issue, uh, water resources, every, everything is connected. And so you think about humans and what we're dealing with in terms of the Ogallala Aquifer potentially having only you know 30 years left of uh, productive water. You look at the fact that 80% of the state it has an aquifer underneath it. Um, how do we tap into what is a 300 million year old sea in the Permian Basin? Uh, where there are minerals, where there is water, and how do we look at the potential to produce water out of the Permian, for instance, for agriculture, where maybe we shift some of the, the burden on aquifers away and towards um, produced water. And what kind of incentives do we put in place that are really market driven, just like the Farm and Ranch Lands Conservation Program that I talked about? You look at the investments that we're making in the coast. We have the second highest passage rate of migratory birds in the world on our Texas coast. So you've got two migratory flyways that come through the Laguna Madre and along the Texas coast. And so we've got to make sure that the investments, for instance, that we're making in uh, barrier islands and rookery islands for those birds are uh, made in a you know, forward thinking manner. And so there are all these things that we can do. And that movie really was about, and we created curriculum that's free, Teaks Align, Next Generation Science Standards, uh, that's on our website. And the idea there was we've got to create a new generation of Texans that are thinking about all of these issues, because a lot of them are living in, in cities. And so they got to think about where does their water come from? And when, when a drop of rain falls in the Davis Mountains, or in Marathon, or in the Piney Woods, where does that ultimately go? And how does that impact wildlife along the way? And what can we be doing uh, with it in terms of how we're building out water infrastructure like reservoirs? Uh, do we need more above ground reservoirs or, or can we actually store that water underground uh, when it's plentiful? Um, so there are all of these things that are interconnected. And when you look at the general land office, you look at university lands, you look at the Texas Water Development Board, uh, you look at TCEQ and all of these uh, nonprofit conservation organizations. There's there's just a lot that we could all be talking about that we care about and that we agree on. And we know that we've got some problems to face. And I think that this office could be a real platform to talk about those things in a very practical way. And I just happen to come from a family that's been ranching uh, for 200 years, nearly 200 years. So I kind of know a little bit of what I'm talking about and thinking about these decisions, not just in election cycles, but in generational terms. And, and that's what I think we need. Um, and it's, it's, to me, it's not just Im important, we don't have an option. Like we have to address these challenges. And um, that I do think that we're at a time where we've got to come together on some of these things. I think, yeah, it's pivotal right now. I mean, 
the time is now to do something on climate change. So it's it's never been more important. That's why everything feels like it's on the table in this election. Um, are there any other issues that we haven't talked about that the that the land office faces? I mean, we definitely talked about a lot of things, but I want to make sure we get to everything that is important to you. That is there anything we should be touching on? You know, I think just as a kind of to to sum things up, you know, when people ask about this office, it manages your public lands, it provides critical support to public schools and veterans, and it helps Texans prepare for and recover from natural disasters. And I've talked a lot about different topics, but the, the top two priorities are our veterans and disaster recovery and education. Those three things are, uh, it's imperative that we invest in those and that we actually turn them around. I mean, the Veterans Land Board, I think I mentioned, has not had an executive director for two years. And so that's that's a a, a fix right immediately. We've got all these disaster recovery recovery dollars that, that I've got a very clear plan and we've talked to a lot of experts. We know how to do this and if Texas can do it, we can actually lead the way in a lot of these areas in the low emission future, how we prepare for uh, natural disasters and how we take care of our veterans. We're doing a lot of, of good things, but we could be doing them um, in, 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 a, in a way that's a model for the rest of the world. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much, Jay. What, what can we do right now to help you win this campaign? Where do you need help? How can we help you? Where can we find you? Tell us all the things. Yeah, I think, you know, we're at a stage right now where we're going to start as you are um, putting out paid communications. You know, that's that's a way that you can really scale your message. And so um, fundraising is, is something that we're, you know, honed in on. Uh, you can go to our website and also find out where we're going to be. So we'll be in El Paso and Houston this week. You can put your information into the website if you want to do um, any kind of volunteering. We've partnered with Blue Action Dems. And so we're we're pushing a lot of our um, relational organizing to, to them. Uh, we've got signs uh, on our website. We've got a lot of ways to interact with, with the campaign. Honestly, what I would say is we're at a point now where in the next couple of weeks, I will be making a plan for who you are going to contact, who you're going to text and call, and make sure that 10 people, 10 of your friends are, are voting. And I think that that's really critical. And, and you can check in the voter rolls or you can just keep asking them uh, wh- whether they've actually you know voted. Because I think what we've seen in the past, and you're seeing this in rural parts of the state, is you know, I think there's a sense that we've been losing these statewide offices for for a few decades and a sense of hopelessness. But I do see that if we slightly in all of these areas, it's not a lot. It's several hundred thousand votes that you all of a sudden win these races in a way that you can't gerrymander the state. And so that it's where it starts. You cannot gerrymander a state. And so it's really where your vote counts. And so I would just say, make sure that you're you are voting and that you're making sure that 10 of your friends are as well. Yeah. Someone just said, get the 18 to 24 year olds out to vote. Yeah, absolutely. They need to vote. They're really worried about climate change. We need to vote for a candidate that actually believes in climate change versus Don Buckingham, who's just not qualified at all to run this office. Um, So thank you. Thank you for your time. I just put on um, the website is uh, J, the number four, Texas, TX, J4TX.com. So please go and follow Jay on all of the things, on all the social media channels that you are part of, and please contribute to his campaign. And I heard that we have a new ad coming out sometime soon. So I'm really excited about that. Can't wait to see it. Congratulations on your uh, award. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so (laughs) much. (laughs) I might see you there. Um, So uh, thank you so much for joining me today, Jay, and for taking time to meet with Mothers Against Greg Abbott. It was a pleasure having you. Uh, We are endorsing you. Of course, you know that all of our all of our graphics will be out in the next two days because we just finished them this weekend. So we're all done with them. We'll be putting out a lot more graphics soon. So pretty soon we'll have graphics that everybody can use to show their support for Jay. 
So thank you. Have a great day.